Hello, everyone. We are very glad to be here to share our talk. Tamkida, leveraging a synchronous clock to escape from QEMU KVM. Uh, first of all, let me do a do a brief intro, self introduction. Uh, my name is Jia Yongkang, and this is, and this is Lei Xiao. This is Tao Yiming. We are all from Zhejiang. Uh, we are all from Zhejiang University in China, um, but now I I have graduated, and I am going to be a security researcher at the Singular Security Lab. Okay, let's start. We have divided our talk into the following sections. First, uh, I will introduce the background. Then I will introduce a synchronous clock and uh, uh, virtual capital. And uh, I will uh, I will introduce uh, uh, how do we discover in the uh, vulnerabilities. And uh, we will analyze analyze the vulnerabilities and uh, introduce how to exploit. Last, we will do a conclusion. First, I'm going to introduce the background of our research. Okay, the core of this talk is an exploit tactic of QEM UKVM. So let's make a brief introduction about QE, about QEM UKVM. QEM UKVM is a widely used and open source virtualization framework. In this framework, QEMU runs in user mode and uh, many provide the device uh, virtualization, while KVM runs in kernel mode and many provide CPU virtualization, memory virtualization, and uh, interrupt virtualization. So, uh, so far, many security researchers have conducted related research in QEMU. It's difficult to find new vulnerabilities on the traditional attack surface. So if you want, if you want to do some security research in QEMU, you need to explore new, new attack surface, such as, such as GPU virtualization or risk condition bugs and so on. Another way, another way is to explore a new Explore skill, such as finding some metal primitives and some useful structures. So, why we start our research? We mentioned earlier that risk condition vulnerabilities may be a new attack surface for QEMU. In fact, risk condition vulnerabilities already exist widely in operation systems and some other virtualization products, such as WinWare and uh, VirtualBox. However, we really see bugs caused by risk conditions in QEMU. So do risk, con so do risk condition bugs widely exist in QEMU? In order to clarify the above question, we researched on the asynchronous uh, mechanism in QEMU. As we know, a asynchronous mechanism exists widely in, in various systems and software, which is designed to avoid blocking. Usually, there are two ways to implement the asynchronous uh, mechanism. One is multi-threading, and the other is timer, which is the uh, asynchronous clock we are going to talk about. Okay. Uh, QMU's main threading is a is a, a single thread. Uh, is a single thread which provides the uh, event and the callback function, of course, uh, time, including timer, of course, and the virtualization mainly runs in the main thread as well. 
That's why risk condition vulnerabilities already occurred in QEMU's virtualization devices. Some virtualization devices that must communicate asynchronous are realized by asynchronous clock. Next, let's take a look at asynchronous clock in QEMU. A timer in QEMU is called a QEMU timer, which provides a means of calling a back after interval, uh, after time interval elapsed, uh, has elapsed, passing an OPEC pointer to the callback. There are four types of clock in QEMU. First is real time clock, which runs when the VM is stopped. Second is virtual clock, which runs when the VM is running. Third is host clock, which runs when the VM is suspended, but is sensitive to time changes to the system clock. The last is real-time clock used for account warp, which is the same as QEMU clock virtual outside, outside account mode. Each user of timer maintains a QEMU timer list, timer, timer list group. This is a, this is a structure currently consisting solely of an array of QEMU timer list, timer list pointers, one for each clock type. Each QEMU timer list maintains a pointer to the clock to which, to which it is connected. It's on a list of QEMU time list for that QEMU clock. It contains a pointer to the, to the first, to the first active timer. Each QEMU timer object contains a link back to a, back to its timer list for manipulation of the list. So what can QEMU timer do? In QEMU devices, QEMU timer helps them to handle a synchronous request, such as network, USB, disk, crypto, and so on. QEMU timer also can be used for fuzzing. For example, we shuttle use QEMU timer to trigger fuzzing entry routine. Of course, QEMU timer can be used for exploit. The most common way is to control PC by high, oh sorry, by hijacking the callback function of QEMU timer. Besides QEMU timer, QEMU includes a throttling mode that can be, that can be used to set limits to IO operations. It's currently used to limit the number of bytes per second and operations per second when performing disk I.O. There are two important parameters in sort model. Uh, uh, the first is BPS, which stands for bytes per second. The other is OPS, which stands for operations per second. Uh, you can find uh, more details about uh, sort uh, in this link. Okay, now we are, now we will give a brief introduction about a virtual, virtual crypto device. Virtual crypto is a virtual cryptography device under virtual IO device framework, which provides a set of unified operation interface for different cryptography services. You can find the, you can find more information about virtual IO uh, in this link. So why we choose why we choose what virtual crypto device? First, cryptography used widely in cloud, such as wireless, telecom, data center, and, and so on. Second, virtual IO device is 
continuously update, which introduce which introduce the which introduce the RSA algorithm on June 2022 and support a asynchronous mode on November 2022. Yes. It's known to all that new features may mean new bugs. Third, the device is lack of security research in recent five years. The previous we about a virtual crypto device is assigned in 2017, which was reported by Li Chang. Last but not least, the, this device supports a synchronous nature now. From, from virtual IO's perspective, it has two types of queues. One is control queue. Virtual IO device has one, one, has one control queue which provides session ma ma management for symmetric or asymmetric service and uh, facilitate the control operations for device, for device. Another is data queue as a transport channel for crypto service service requests, which can apply for up to 1,023. Next, let's take a look at the request of control queue. When virtual crypto process the request of control queue, it uh, will create different sessions according to the, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, according to the opcode field, in virtual crypto control header structure. For example, for example, SYM create, se create session here stands for symmetric crypto session and uh, AK cipher crypto session stands for a symmetric crypto session. Uh, similarly, in the request of the data queue, different requests will be processed ac ac according to the uh, up code in the virtual crypto OP head structure, such as symmetric crypto, uh, crypto operation or a symmetric crypto operation. There are many, there are many two service, services in the virtual crypto device. One is symmetric encryption decryption and uh, the other is uh, Asymmetric encryption and decryption. The encryption algorithm currently supported by what I is AES by default, uh, and this is a struct and this is a structure to implement a symmetric encrypted data transmission, including IV learn, SRC learn, and uh, other fields we are very familiar with. Uh, similarly, uh, as a symmetric Encryption also has its own structure, which is relatively simple. Just uh, uh, with only four fields: SRC learn, DST learn, SRC pointer, and DST pointer. In a symmetric service, only the RSA algorithm is implemented currently, and it may support the DSA and ECDSA algorithm in the future. Okay. In the guest, uh, we have two ways to communicate to, com to communicate with the virtual IO crypto device in the host. Uh, user, user space driver and the kernel space driver, respectively. In the host, virtual IO crypto as a unified uh, interface will call software library finally, such as QCrypto, built-in driver, libgcrypto, libletter, and so on. Sorry. Okay. okay. Virtual IO crypto device has two operation models. The first is synchronous mode. Uh, in this mode, 
or watch our device, watch our crypto will immediate will immediately do encryption and uh, decryption operations after receiving the request, and then complete this request, including free including free related structure. However, in a synchronous mode, what our crypto will not uh, do encryption and decryption operations immediately after receiving the request. But as the encryption and the decryption operations to the timer queue and wait for the clock to trigger before, before doing operations. In the, in this case, what a crypto, uh, what a crypto will keep relevant structures while handle requests. This small difference has a big effect. Okay. From, uh, from, from the, Perspective of memory allocation, uh, the uh, in synchronous mode the chunk is a malloc use and a free chunk, but in a synchronous mode the chunk is just a block and a use chunk. Yes. Uh, okay, this is a command to enable a synchronous mode. We only need to. Configure throttle BPS and uh, uh, throttle OPS. For example, if we set the BPS to 10 and uh, the encrypted and the size of encrypted data is uh, 30, it will take at least three seconds to finish the encryption. Okay, let's make a summary about. Uh, Watch IO Crypto. First of all, Watch IO Crypto imp implements the AS algorithm and the, and, and the cryptographic operation of AS can be set in synchronous mode and a uh, synchronous mode. Since June last year, Watch IO Crypto device has added the RSA algorithm. RSA also has two operation modes, synchronous and uh, synchronous. Okay, after introducing the virtual crypto device, <laughs> let's take a let's let's talk about how to discover the vulnerabilities of this device. Combined with some previous previous experience, we decided to fuzz the device before fuzzing. Before fuzzing, we need to think about the following two questions. The first question is which father to use. There are many, there are many fuzzing framework that can fuzz QEMU, such as libfuzz in QEMU, FL, and uh, our own fuzzing framework Vshuttle. We, we excluded the libfuzz in QEMU as I am not very familiar with it. <laughs> Sorry. AFL was also ruled out as major, as major changes would be required for adaption. Finally, I choose Wishato, which is my favorite QEMU device father, and it can be applied to the fuzzing of virtual crypto with a little modified. The second question is the applicability of our father. It's to Limited if our father only applies to the virtual crypto device and it will do more work if we, if we want, if we, if we want to cover all devices. Therefore, we finally set the scope on the fuzzing of virtual device. Okay. Since the original Vishato was designed for fuzzing DMA devices, we need to make some improvements on it. In order to trigger virtual control queues handlers and uh, virtual data queues handlers, I add some initial operations in fuzzing entry, such as creating some viewing buffer with correct, with correct address and uh, initiating virtual by call a series what what are our PCI common write function? The second, I hooked the LV buff for transport fuzzing seeds. Last, I 
uh, in order to mo in order to monitor the st uh, stack frame of QEMU when crash occurs, I redirected the log in information to the file. Okay, this page is the overview of Reshuttle. And uh, this and this is uh, our time key fading. I just made some small improvements, but got a good result. We quickly defined the first by first bug by fading. Uh, after fading some days, we got a high coverage in virtual crypto device, and uh, uh, in the end, we we found the four bugs and report them all. Uh, next, let uh, Yi Tao analyze these vulnerabilities for you. Okay, it's my turn to introduce the following section. In this section, we will introduce some vulnerabilities found in the way of part 4, which is include three, three non-pointing frames actual, uh, and a heap buff, buff overflow actual, which could lead to an escape from the gas to the host. And all of the four vulnerabilities I found in the virtual crypto 2 device. Okay, let's turn to the first one. It's a non-pointing frames vulnerability, which is located in the virtual crypto free request function. This function always triggers in the end of the encryption or decryption process to zero rows and free the data request structure. Okay, just look at the code. Uh, attached for the first line is called the memset function to set the op info to zero and then call the gfree function to free it. But you can find that because it's two line code, there's no check of the value for the op info. So if the op info is set as a non value before, then in the function what have free request, a non value will be set as a parameter into the memset function and cause a non point difference which will cause a uh, dinosaur service. Okay, this page, uh, I will introduce how to ensure, how to trigger this bug. Uh, the code attach is part of the intrusion of the open info. Uh, another return value will be set to the open info. We can find that there are two ways to make open info to a non-value. Okay, for the first one, we can find that for what our crypto, it only supports two types of encryption. Plain simple and the algorithm chain. So if the tip is set different from the bar two, then the function will return one a uh, non-value finally. Okay, then for the first one, uh, if the length of the open info is set is set as an excessive value, the open info will be set as a non-value as well. And the uh, under the length, uh, but under the length under the tip has mentioned before, I completely controller by the guest. So if we set one of them to a certain value, then after uh, encryption or decryption, the QMU will go to crash in the virtual free request function. Okay, let's turn to the second one. It's also a non-point difference issue which is located in the crypto dial backend account. For QMU itself, it doesn't achieve an RSA encryption or decryption its built-in driver. So if we want to call for a RSA service, we should have a library while compiling the QMU, such as the, uh, such as the libgcrypt. Uh, so there is coming, uh, so it's a coming, uh, Daniel service issue. If we call for a RSA service, but there is no addition of the library for RSA has compiling to the QMU. The crypto dial backend function, uh, backend account function is used to, to Account the, uh, record the account of the bytes has, uh, encrypted before. Uh, but if the, but if there is no addition of the library for the RSA has compiling to QMU, the, the structure that plays the amount of the bytes will be set as known. And uh, in the crypto dial backend account function, just uh, in this function, uh, the parameter will be set as known family and uh, which will cause a non-point difference issue. Okay, here is a page about this bug. We just uh, add a check of the structure we have mentioned before. Uh, before we uh, truly come to do the encryption or decryption. Okay, now it's the third one. It's also a non-point difference vulnerability which is located in the crypto dial building operation. 
This function can be triggered when we do, uh, we will do, uh, semantic encrypt, uh, when we do, um, encryption or decryption, uh, if we choose the built-in backend as a driver. For the built-in backend, it supports the AES and the RSA encryption or decryption interface. And uh, both the AES and the RSA session, I share the same structure, which is contain, uh, which is contain a structure zipper for the semantic encryption or decryption and the uh, unstruct X zipper for the, uh, a semantic encryption or decryption. And both the AES and the RSA sessions are shared in the same areas. Besides, during the initialization of the session, only one structure in the zipper and X zipper can be initialized, while the other one will be set as a non-value. So if an incorrect matching between the encryption or decryption uh, algorithm and the session was set, a non-point difference issue may happen. Okay, this page has more details about this, about this bug. In crypto, in crypto dial built-in operation function, just look at the code had a mark, marked read. Uh, this code do a check of the session we have choose. Uh, but we can find that it just check the uh, value of the session, but there's no check for the tip of the session. This means that if, for example, if we choose an AES session during the process of the RSA encryption or decryption, then in the uh, subsequent function, crypto del, uh, this is, sorry, crypto del built-in SM operand function, the exit pro in the session will be set as new, and it will be set as a parameter in this function. And finally, a non-point difference will happen as well. Okay, let's turn to the last vulnerabilities. It's a hill best buffer overflow which has assigned a CV number. Uh, this bug could, could trigger during the process of the uh, semantic encryption or, de or decryption. And for whatever crypto, we can find that we allocate space for the CPRO test and the uh, plan test in the structure OpenInfo. And uh, as we all know, for semantic encryption or decryption, the length of the CPRO test is equal to the length of the plan test. And uh, in, uh, but in what are crypto, the source length and the death length are completely controlled by the guards. This means that if we set a source length, is larger than the death length. Then after a successful encryption or decryption, the source, uh, the, the death length, well, the, the zipper test will exceed the length of the, uh, will exceed the death length and, uh, exceed the length of the open info. Um, okay. Here is an example about this bug. Uh, for preparation, we set the, we set the IV length to zero and the source length to hex 18 and the data length to hex 14 and the hash result length to zero. And uh, after uh, allocation, we can find that the data bar for the CPR test is set at the end of the open info. And the source, uh, and the source bar for plan test is hex 14 larger than the data bar. Okay, then we can choose AES to do an encryption, and after encryption, there will generous hex 18 length zipper test, uh, zipper test, and, uh, and exceed the length of the data buff, and finally, a heap buff flow, a heap, a heap overflow will happen. Besides, um, for what our crypto, the plan test is completely controlled by the ghost. So if we choose a certain secret key and a uh, encryption, uh, and the uh, encryption tip, uh, then after a, a successful encryption, the CPR test will be controlled by the guards as well. This means that we can control the overflow data, which will help our subsequent explosion. Okay, uh, this page is a page, a patch of this bug. Uh, we just add a check for the source length and the death length before the allocation of the open info. If the source length is not equal to the death length, the QMU will uh, got an error and, uh, and the encryption and the decryption. Oh, sorry. Okay, let's please make my partner shortly to continue the next section. Uh, okay, I, I will show you how we leverage the heap based overflow uh, right uh, to QMU escape.
Uh, first of all, uh, let's see when faced with a single out of bounce ride vulnerability, uh, what we mostly tend to do to obtain an arbitrary code execution. Uh, there are two key things here, um, mal malloc primitive and ex exploitable structure. Uh, since we have an out of bounds write here, uh, we have to find a, a victim object uh, to overwrite. Uh, mostly, uh, this exploitable structure is your one common feature. Uh, that is, they contain some uh, data pointer, function pointer, or some length members. Uh, but uh, override this members won't be a easy thing. Uh, therefore, we need to find uh, malloc primitives to help us make heap manipulation. Uh, we will have to make some uh, heap spray or heap function to keep the heap in a somehow ideal state, uh, like uh, putting the victim exploitable structure next to the overload buffer. Uh, only then uh, it would be possible for us to uh, leverage an out of bounds write to get information leakage or control flow hijack, and finally execute arbitrary code. Uh, to exploit this vulnerability, we have tried to find some previous work that might help us. Uh, one of them is the work that leveraged the vulnerability in virtual IO GPU to make a QMU escape. Uh, we focus on the information leakage part, part of it, uh, which is an uninitialized bar cost by using malloc to allocate memory uh, without uh, clear the contents. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it has already been fixed by replacing the malloc with calloc, so we cannot use it anymore. And the other one is the black box escape uh, using the vulnerability in USB device. Uh, however, the out of bounds read and write happens inside of the uh, USB device structure. And information leak is quite straightforward here th uh, since there is n not only the out of bounds write but also the out of bounds read capability. Uh, and it's and it's nearly impossible to make heap manipulation uh, using this USB device structure uh, because there is only one object uh, created for USB device. And the last one is uh, a network component supported by Slurp. And the author has lever leveraged the IP fragment mechanism to make a successful exploit. Uh, and this Vulnerability only provides an out of bounds write capability, uh, which is quite the same as ours. And the uh, mbuffer, struc uh, mbuffer structure here contains members mdata and mlan to help us obtain arbitrary address read and write capabilities. Uh, sadly, uh, to reproduce that is not as e uh, is not very easy. Um, Therefore, we have to find a much easier way out. Sorry. Uh, so we start to focus on the virtual IO crypto device itself. Uh, and we surprisingly find that uh, the virtual IO crypto provides us perfect malloc primitives and exploitable structures. Uh, when we make a symmetric encryption request, uh, QMI will handle it by calling the helper function. Uh, as we can see here, the helper function uh, allocate an op info object uh, whose size is decided by this uh, lens arguments. And these lens arguments are all provided by uh, guest uh, with only a few constraints. Uh, there is also one similar helper function that possesses the asymmetric encryption request. And the source and the location here is even more powerful without any limitation. Uh, as for the uh, exploitable structures, uh, these two structures presented here uh, both contain some data pointers and some length uh, fields accordingly. 
Uh, if we override the source length here, uh, we could easily turn an out of bounds write to an out of bounds read. And if we override these pointers, we could easily make arbitrary address read and write too. Uh, there is also one uh, useful request structure here containing callback and opaque that could help us hijack control flow. Uh, more, in more, more importantly, uh, the member uh, the member in here uh, is a pointer that points to guest memory space, uh, which means uh, leak its value uh, would help us get the guest memory space address. And callback could also be the will also be used to leak the accumulated image address. Uh, however, when developing the exploit, uh, we found that every encryption process is synchronous by default. Uh, that means when we make an encryption request, uh, QMU will follow the order of uh, handling the request, allocating the necessary structures, uh, doing the encryption, uh, ret returning the results and freeing uh, all the allocated structures uh, is a atomic uh, malloc use free process that we cannot do anything useful during the time. Uh, therefore, uh, the uh, there will be only one instance of exploitable structure uh, residing in memory, and once uh, we allocate the vulnerable sim op info. Uh, it's really hard for us to overwrite another exploitable structure. Uh, the only way is to uh, maybe pre prepare a trunk hole ahead of time and, and put the vulnerable sim op info into it, uh, which is very difficult and unstable. And uh, hip manipulation is also impossible here since uh, we could not uh, make multiple requests handled at the same time. Uh, fortunately, all these problems could be handled by a synchronous clock. Uh, the main idea of time killer exploit is uh, to make use of the asynchronous clock. Uh, with the throttle BPS set, uh, we could let QMU handle multiple encryption requests ac across asynchronously. Uh, to realize that we could make an uh, encryption request that contains a large number of data to be processed, and it will consume a certain time which uh, makes the following requests keep waiting. And these objects allocated by these requests will then stay in memory during the time window. Uh, as a result, uh, we could now make heap manipulation and override this exploitable structures freely. Now come back to our exploitable, exploit development. Uh, the first thing we should do is uh, information leakage. Uh, so we have to turn the uh, only attender out of bounds write to out of bounds read. Uh, first, uh, we prepare a vulnerable sim op info in hip, uh, and its test member uh, will point to the tail of the object uh, since it's an inline buffer. Uh, second, uh, we put an uh, asim op info next to the vulnerable sim op info, and the source buffer uh, of the asim op info will be allocated at the same time. And then, uh, we put a victim request next to the async open for source buffer. Now we start the out of start the trick the out of bounds write, uh, which will uh, overwrite source land member of the victim async open info. Uh, finally, uh, when the Asym asymmetric encryption process starts uh, since its source length has has been overwritten into a bigger value. Uh, the source buffer will be overflowed too, uh, so that the adjacent uh, request members uh, will be encrypted and the results will be sent back to the guest. Uh, in this way, uh, we could decrypt the ciphertext and get the request member uh, in callback and opaque. Uh, you can see that uh, the member in is a 
uh, gets the memory address, and callback is a QMU image address, and the opaque is a heap address. Uh, after that, uh, we just uh, uh, bypass ASLR. Uh, to explain what we really do to realize that plan, uh, we show the main steps here. And next part, we will show you how to follow these steps to make heap manipulation in detail. At the beginning, uh, we make an encryption request, uh, which reserves a significant time window for the following process. Uh, then, with the help of uh, ASIM op info test buffer, uh, we prepare a trunk uh, with size hex 1CO, and this trunk will be reserved for using in the future. And then, also with the help of uh, ASIM op info test buffer, uh, we do hip spray to make hip manipulation and clear the small bins with this size. Uh, we could get this. Sorry. Uh, uh, we we can see that uh, the small bean hex uh, twenty and hex seventeen are all cleared. Uh, after spraying is down, uh, we free the. Uh, hex 1CO trunk in the first step uh, by simply waiting its request to be handled. Uh, we can see that the small beans with size hex 1AO and hex 1BO are both cleared and uh, with only one hex 1CO trunk is left here. Uh, next, uh, when we allocate the uh, vulnerable CMO pin for with size hex 1AO, uh, the hex 1CO small bin will split. Uh, the CMO pin for will take the hex 1AO part from head and leaves a uh, hex 20 small bin. Uh, now we could allocate the uh, ACMO pin for structure, uh, which will take the left uh, hex 20 small bin. At the same time, uh, the only unsorted bin here uh, will split, uh, and the source buffer uh, will take the hex 70 part. Uh, the remainder part of the unsorted bin will eventually go back to the large bin. Uh, the last thing we do is let the victim request take the trunk from the left large bin, uh, which makes it uh, adjacent to the source buffer of the ACMOP info. After the hip, hip manipulation is down, uh, we just need to wait the uh, uh, victim asymmetric encryption down, uh, decrypt the result, and complete the information leakage. As a result, uh, we bypassed ASLR. Uh, okay, let's uh, let's head to hijack control flow. Uh, these are two ways for us. Uh, there are two ways for us to realize this. Uh, the first method is to leverage S1 sim op info to make arbitrary address write, and our target is the cumulative time list. Uh, just like the first several steps we do in information leakage, uh, we need to hit the we need the heap layout to be like this. Uh, the victim CMOP info is next to the CMOP info in memory. And since we get guest memory address, uh, we could prepare payload in guest memory easily. Uh, the payload content will be a pointer and a malicious timer structure, uh, which the pointer points to. And then uh, we just need to trigger the vulnerability and override the victim's CMOP info source and test the pointer. And make them points to the payload in guest memory and uh, main loop TLG's cumulative list point area separately. Uh, when the victim's symmetric encryption process is done, uh, the pointer prepared in guest memory will be written to the cumulative time list pointer area, uh, which helps us uh, successfully hijack the cumulative time list. As for the another method, uh, 
The only difference is we choose a uh, request structure to be next to the vulnerable SIM OP info object. Uh, and the payload we prepare in guest memory, uh, our system PLT address and uh, command string address. And, uh, and the out of bounds write will help us override the member callback and opaque member of the request object to system PLT and command string address separately. Finally, we just uh, wait for the victim request to be handled and the callback function will be called and thus we execute system CMD successfully. And this time we only need to care about the large means uh, since we need to let the vulnerable SIM open info and victim request malloc from one large bin sequently. Uh, so we make heap spray here to clear large bins with small size to make sure they won't uh, malloc uh, from two different large bins. Uh, in detail, they will be just like this uh, and therefore the same op info and the request are ad adjacent in memory. Uh, after heap manipulation, uh, when the callback is triggered, we can see that uh, the control flow has been hijacked and we finally make a arbitrary code execution. Uh, put all these things together, uh, we make a successful QMU escape. Uh, here is a demo that shows how our exploit work. And uh, and it takes uh, about one minute to boot the guest VM, so we just jump to the. So we finally pop a calculator here. Oh, okay, okay. Let me do a, a con conclusion. Uh, uh, okay, let me do a conclusion. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry.
Oh, oh, okay. Now, uh, now you got a new exploit skill. Uh, if you feel find a heap of overflow right vulnerabilities in QEMU and the size of the overflow exceeds hex 48, you can use time killer to help escape from QEMU KVM. We propose two methods to help explore your to to explore to help explore the heap overflow right vulnerabilities. Okay, let's begin the story. Uh, our goal is to find some risk condition bugs in QEMU. In the end, we failed to find the risk condition bugs in QEMU. But fortunately, we find a new exploit skill in QEMU. There is an old saying in China that goes well. Uh, watch the. A watched flower never blooms, but an untended video grows. So this is the beauty of security research. You can always find a surprise along the way. Thank you. Thank, thank you, guys. Are there any questions as we open to the Q&A before we start the uh, TCP IP networking social? Any questions? Yeah. Thank you for the talk. Very good, very good one. Um, do you also test it against the CFI protection um, on the kernel? The so control for integrity? No, no. So you assume that it's, it is disabled, right? The QMU, uh, QMU is, uh, is running in uh, user space. Uh, user space, not in kernel mode. I see. So there's no CFI on the uh, user space. Yeah, the, the kernel is K KVM. KVM module runs in the kernel mode, and the QMU runs in the user mode. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Any other questions?